Port-au-Prince, 1796. The British soldiers come ashore and die. Come ashore and die. One of the largest expeditions to this point in British history, 20,000 men and thousands of German mercenaries disembark. Within four months, most are cut down by yellow fever. Back in Britain, troops riot upon the announcement of a deployment to saint -Dumain. British forces end up hiring 7,000 black mercenaries to fight for them. Some reports will claim that 60% of the British expedition, 15,000 men, will die. And those that make it to the interior of the island find something frightening. The troops of Brigadier General Toussaint Louverture and his ally André Rigaud fighting like professional soldiers. They do, after all, have years of combat experience. But soon, instead of fighting the British, they will fight each other. With general emancipation declared and the departure of the Spanish, things started to level out for Toussaint. Not calm down necessarily. I mean, he was still fighting. But with the British pinned to the coast and rivals fighting low-intensity conflicts, he could turn to actually governing. He was in control of the North Province, while his ally and rival, André Rigaud, a free person of color who'd long taken part in the group's insurrection, controlled the South. Thus, the colony was essentially divided into two rival administrative centers that would ultimately come to blows in what would be known as the War of Knives. But in 1793, the word was consolidation. Finally, Toussaint had a chance to enact his vision for an integrated post-slavery society, one that brought the white, free people of color, and black populations into a peaceful, functioning whole, which would prove difficult. Part of that difficulty was that saint Dumont's economy was dysfunctional by design. France had wanted the colonists to be dependent on France, and had therefore restricted industry, to the point that the island was solely focused on producing sugar, coffee, and indigo. It was restricted from making any moves that might make it self-sufficient. In fact, it had to import food to sustain its population. So the only system that worked was to continue producing sugar, coffee, and indigo. But a few problems there. First, the destruction of the plantation infrastructure early in the revolution meant that major rebuilding would need to take place. Second, many of those plantations still had living owners, many of them refugees, and could not simply be given away under French law. They had to be managed in trust. And finally, no one wanted to go back to doing the same awful work they'd been forced to do when they were enslaved. But Toussaint and Rigaud solved that last situation using the same means everyone in this conflict always used, military force. They used troops to force people back onto the plantations. Now, this was not slavery. It was forced work. The difference being that the workers were paid, physical punishment was forbidden, and no one's spouse or children were getting sold away. They also had rights and protections as citizens, including the right to legally marry. This is a stain on Toussaint's legacy, as were the violent repressions he unleashed on those who rose against this forced labor program. But in Toussaint's estimation, this and other autocratic actions he would take were necessary to guard the freedoms that they had won. He knew that Saint-Dumont, fairly or not, would be seen as a test case for abolitionism. And what happened there would send a message across the world about whether freed slaves could not only be integrated into a wider society, but could build and sustain their own government. If Saint-Dumont collapsed, not only might slavery return, in fact there were big whites in Paris advocating for just that, but opponents would draw the conclusion that abolition had been a mistake. And such a determination would have global consequences. And Toussaint increasingly believed he was the only one that could secure the revolution and the freedoms they'd won. As he fought the British, his power growing, he began to edge out political rivals, even allies. When one longtime rival rebelled and captured the colony's governor, accusing him of trying to reinstate slavery, Toussaint rescued the man and got named lieutenant governor for the service. During the election for the colony's representatives in France, Toussaint steered his rival to victory so that then they would be forced to live in France, far from his developing power center. He would get himself declared governor general shortly afterward. And in 1798, he started conducting his own diplomacy. He concluded a secret peace with the British, where they would withdraw their troops and naval blockade from saint Dumont in exchange for the return of French royalists and a promise that Toussaint would not export the uprising to Barbados. That concluded, he sent a representative to the United States, striking a deal with John Adams so the undeclared naval war between the U.S. and France would not affect trade with saint Dumont. Because, you see, another running theme to think about, and you're keeping track of all of these, right, was that saint Dumont was always a piece in a larger game. The United States was right next door, as was British Barbados, and France supported whatever leader, in their estimation, best served their interests. 
and that interplay of various powers sponsoring or intervening in the island's affairs will become a major part of Haitian history all the way to present day. In other words, Toussaint was increasingly behaving like the leader of an independent nation, though he did so with the veneer of French support. He was, after all, a brigadier general of the Republic, and would remain so as long as the French upheld their abolition of slavery. In fact, Toussaint had essentially ejected the previous governor. Meanwhile, relationships between Toussaint and Rigaud began to sour, partially due to that expelled governor playing political games about which one was higher ranking, and partially due to the fact that they both wanted total control. Soon, Rigaud appealed to France, casting himself as the loyal revolutionary, and Toussaint as a dictatorial usurper who wanted independence. Toussaint, by contrast, began claiming that Rigaud planned to reimpose slavery. A slander Rigaud turned back on him. Of course, neither wanted that, but there were factions on both sides willing to believe it. Toussaint had invited back many plantation owners in order to rebuild the economy, so it seemed plausible from that angle, and Rigaud had rebuilt the southern province with a caste system with the free people of color on top. So again, people could imagine it. Both leaders had alienated supporters with their forced work policies, and those alienated groups started believing that the other leader would never treat them like that, and both accused the other of perpetrating a race war even though there were representatives of all of the island's groups on both sides. Strip away the rhetoric, though, and this was a struggle between two leaders for supremacy. On June 6, 1799, Rigaud sent 4,000 troops to seize several border towns and negotiate the defection of one of Toussaint's veteran regiments. The act triggered a small uprising in Toussaint's northern territory, and he dodged two assassination attempts. In one, Toussaint had his hat shot off and an aide killed. In another, his carriage was peppered with a volley of bullets, though by pure chance, he was not inside. Thus began a civil war that would come to be known as the War of Knives. And it earned that title through blood. Both sides offered no quarter, and prisoners, when taken at all, rarely lasted long. At the outset of the conflict, Rigaud's forces, better trained and equipped, made quick gains against Toussaint. But the northern general had an enormous numerical advantage and the increasingly open support of the United States. Not only were the Americans shipping Toussaint arms, at times, the United States Navy intervened directly, providing fire support during sieges and blockading ports. The American consul even issued passports to Toussaint's ships, allowing them to pass the blockade when Rigaud's ships could not. And during this vicious fighting, one of Toussaint's commanders rose to prominence, Brigadier General Jacques Desalines, a former slave who had fought through the revolution and who was known for massacring prisoners and rebels with such vindictiveness that Toussaint censored him for it. Though in fact, it is possible Toussaint actually ordered these reprisal killings, using Dessalines as a willing scapegoat to avoid ruining his carefully crafted image of generosity and kindness. The war ground to a stalemate. Rigaud besieged and pinned, but Toussaint, unwilling to expend the casualties necessary to dislodge him. And then, another commission arrived from France. Yeah. Another one, announcing another change in government. General Napoleon Bonaparte had overthrown the political system and declared himself consul. His message? To reaffirm that in the eyes of France, Toussaint was the leader of Saint-Thomas. The war ended basically overnight, with Toussaint allowing Rigaud to slip away into exile in France, which left Toussaint free to invade Santo Domingo, while technically still French was still administered by the Spanish. He claimed it was to prevent his free citizens from getting kidnapped and sold into slavery there, but it may have actually been a bid to bolster his forces through liberation and control all of the island's ports. Because Napoleon's representatives also brought word of a new constitution, one that rescinded the idea that colonies should have the same laws as France. Instead, they would have special laws, you know, tailored to their unique conditions. In other words, Napoleon planned to bring back slavery. In response... Toussaint wrote his own constitution, his own special laws, stating that Saint-Dumont was a sovereign black state, one that rejected slavery outright, and one where he was governor for life. He all but declared independence, and then prepared for invasion. Special thanks to our educational tier patrons Ahmed Ziad Turk, Joseph Blame, and Dominic Valenciana. 